Let's talk about Turkmenistan. <laughs> That's probably a sentence I wasn't expecting to say and you probably weren't expecting to hear in taking classes this term, but I think Turkmenistan is a really interesting example of an autocratic state, its relationships between the elites and the masses, its relationships with its neighbors, and its autocratic institutions' relationships to the... Um, likelihood of conflict within within the state. You might have heard of protests and instability in Kazakhstan in the last year or so. Last that I heard, there's there was increasing repression and a pretty much continuity between the previous uh, regime and the current one. Uh, Turkmenistan in, is one in which you don't really see that much change within the country over time. This week is a crucial week in which you actually are likely to see change, though it really is hard to get unbiased information about what's going on in the country at any times, uh, but specifically this week as they get ready uh, to uh, hold their presidential election. There are some interesting YouTube travel channels in which people do c go and visit Turkmenistan and make videos like the 10 most bizarre things about uh, Turkmenistan. Um, this uh, is one of the buildings made out of white marble that litter the capital of Ashgabat um, that kind of highlight the difference between the capital city and the remainder of uh, the country. The vast majority of the population doesn't live in the capital city of Ashgabat, but around in the periphery. Um, I was lucky enough to visit there 20 years or so uh, ago. They would only give me a transit visa and wouldn't let me stay for more than a little over 72 hours, so I had to go overland from Uzbekistan to catch a Caspian Sea ferry to um, Azerbaijan, but I did get to spend two nights in Ashgabat, and the trains were absolutely crazy. It was part of the train line that goes from Tajikistan that was built during the Cold War all the way to Moscow, and a lot of people that I met on the train in Uzbekistan as well as in Turkmenistan were on their way. Um, to uh, to Moscow for work or for personal reasons. Um, but Turkmenistan, I think, is a really interesting case study of the role of political institutions in people's lives, uh, the role of individual leaders in making decisions that affects the lives of all of their citizens, and the videos that I have on the playlist after this video is the most kind of brutal visualization I can, I've found of the way that leaders with absolute power uh, can both um, consolidate their support as well as need evidence of their support by um, either humiliating their supporters or requiring, requiring their supporters to voice their support for them. A lot of people have heard about North Korea, I'm sure, in this class, but less about uh, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan, looking at the VDEM data, you see basically on civil, civil, I can get it out, civil liberties, democracy, and electoral democracy index. They're pretty much at the lowest end of the scale, uh, similar to Eritrea that we saw in the last video. Contrast that with that kind of stable, low level of political institutional accountability to their economic record, and was and what you can see is the lifespan of the uh, Turkmen economy writ large, that you had a decline in economic production after the end of the Cold War and then a growth slowly and extrably since 1997 when, a lot, when the natural gas exports really took off this kind of slow and steady growth, um, even not really interrupted after the... Um, financial crisis of 2007-2008. You saw the the uh, second derivative slow up a little bit, but it's just pretty much been constantly positive. And you've seen a huge amount of spending on the capital city and on the leadership, um, but the overall GDP per capita doesn't really tie into the livelihoods of people actually living on the ground. Uh, we've talked in the last video about how much it actually cost to buy a Big Mac. There is no McDonald's in Turkmenistan, um, at, at least as far as I know. But in buying day-to-day -day goods, you have to rely on uh, cash is king in a lot of these different countries. And that made me think about the Manat. I think I showed this in one of the previous weeks. This is a 10,000 uh, Manat bill 
This was first generated in 1996. All the banknotes come from uh, England. They devalued uh, the currency in 2008, I want to say, 5,000 of these old monats to a new one. And as you can see in this graph here, in trying to find out what this is, it's probably only worth about a US dollar or so um, now at most. Uh, but you see this consistent set price um, exchange rate, and then it declined um, quite dramatically by um, by at least 10%, 20% uh, um, in 2015, but it's seen relative stability since then. Um, the, even though there are, there are black market exchange rates that'll that'll vary much over time, but com uh, compare the institutional stability of the foreign exchange rate and then the cost of imports um, because there really isn't that large of a manufacturing capacity although the vast majority of people are rural uh, agriculturalists but compare it to um, kyrgyzstan uh, the sum in which this is also probably not worth that much anymore but you see in countries that allow their exchange rate to float as opposed to ones that are fixed just in countries that are pretty close together you see the real purchasing price decline from uh, 2012 to around the election in, in 2015 um, by uh, almost 50 percent and so you have in democratic uh, countries a de facto decline in purchasing power um, in this country we'll be coming back to Kyrgyzstan in the water chapter a bit later on in the term uh, but just the control that the government can exert with the formal exchange rates so that might differ with the um, informal exchange rates or how much people have to be able to uh, barter or trade to be able to um, to survive. A couple of quick um, events in the, the Turkmen timeline in the videos will cover the first uh, video with the journeyman documentary is really interesting and it shows the rotating um, gold statue of the first president um, Niyazov that I saw when I was there in in 2000 um, which it would rotate with the sun uh, the current president removed that but it was just the most amazing amazingly large um, creation that I saw uh, when I was there in Ashgabat now they have an indoor Ferris wheel and a bunch of other things you can see on on YouTube that the the government has built in Ashgabat so um, like with a lot of Soviet republics, um, uh, Turkmenistan became a Soviet republic in 21 after the, um, the, the Bolshevik revolution. There was sporadic armed insurgency against collectivization in the 20s and 30s as a way to kind of show there was a taste for increased accountability and resisting um, the repression in the 20s and 30s, even in a country like Turkmenistan. In 48, there was an earthquake that uh, killed over 100,000 people after it hit Ashgabat, including killing the president's uh, mother. Um, the country declared independence just before the collapse of the USSR, like just before, um, and became part of the Commonwealth of Independent States, those countries that were part of the USSR after independence. Um, President Niyazov was elected unoppo unopposed in the national election in 92. He actually came to power as the head of the Soviet Communist Party in uh, Turkmenistan, like with other leaders of post-Soviet states in Central Asia. Um, the gas pipeline opened in 98 to Iran. Some tensions there about uh, about uh, rates and uh, dependability of the exports there. Um, Nazov was elected president for life in 99. In 2002, he died in 2006. He really started to go full totalitarian and renaming, uh, or maybe, maybe Caesarian, you know, like a, a, one, of the, one of the later Caesars, renaming the months of the year after himself, his mother, and a book that he wrote. You can see the book in the documentary as well. There's a huge marble one that opens up at night. Um, in 2002, there was, uh, his presidential motorcade came under fire. Opposition leaders say that it was staged, that he used it as an excuse to crack down on opposition. Um, this is all often the case in which you do get some personal vulnerability against the leader could lead to repression as well. There is really, really isn't clear evidence of what led to um, the attack, but the 
implications of it for repression are clear. There was uh, increasing crackdowns. Um, there was efforts to share water with Uzbekistan, which will be relevant for the Water Week, which we're going to be talking about. Um, the Aral Sea, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan um, in that week. Um, president Niyazov died of heart failure in 2006. Um, the current president was elected in 2007. He won unopposed. Um, a new there was pipelines um, being built towards Russia and in a push for the government to not necessarily always depend on Iran and Russia there was a push to open up a um, pipeline to China as well as with China's interests and partnerships with a number of countries for resource stability um, China pushed for these kinds of flexible resource allocations and as we can see with the uh, current state of um, uh, Russia's exports, having a multitude of different um, sources can be beneficial for security as well as for Turkmenistan's um, economic stability. I tried to find a graph of where the exports went for the uh, Turkmen um, natural resource extraction, but I couldn't find it. If anyone finds one, I'd be interested uh, to see it. Um, and then in 2012 was the first census since 1995. I mentioned earlier the political sensitivities of measuring who people are, their identities, and questions in the U.S. census were problematic a couple of years ago, um, and the uh, the Australian census as well. And now there is a national election cause uh, called for um, this weekend in March. So you see a history of um, connections to the Soviet Union that was not voluntary, cultural and economic um, connections that existed after that, but a push to try to diversify the, the sources of wealth. The, there's a lack of um, reliable information about Gini coefficients or relative inequality within the country. Um, so I wasn't able to kind of show human security measures within the country to show how it might differentiate with, uh, within the state. Because in Turkmenistan, as with a lot of autocratic systems, there's more information about the leaders uh, than there is about what the people feel within the country. It's hard to get good public opinion data or perceptions of legitimacy or support for the leader when you're the only one that's allowed to run for elective office or as for now with the election on the 12th of March. There are a number of different candidates, I want to say six to nine, but the only one that it has a realistic likelihood of winning is the, the current president's son. Another similarity between the two um, uh, current and former leaders, we'll see if this also applies to um, the son, as he, uh, Serdar, as he gets a bit older, but um, there was uh, an interest in trying to, to continue as with all society, continuing to try to, to, to look young. Um, when I was there, the stories were about how um, Nyazov, who here has uh, non-dyed hair, he, there are photos of him all over the country, um, and supposedly he let his hair go white and then one day decided to dye it black. And so the story that I heard was that uh, everyone had to go around and paint the pictures of him, his hair black, uh, in the middle of the night in order to match his current visibility. The same kind of went in the opposite direction with the current uh, president going natural. Time will tell. His son is young, um, whether he'll have a same kind of trajectory. And I think when you have a new political leadership, it's always remember that graph of the inverted U with the Hegre et al. piece that when there's political change, that's when things are the most uh, vulnerable. Um, what kind of leader is the son going to be? There was a lot of hopes for Bashar al-Assad after his father's rule that he would be a more modern uh, leader, educated in, in the West, um, and uh, had a professional degree, whether he'd be more open. Um, the current president's son here in Turkmenistan has been groomed for leadership, playing roles within the government. Uh, and it's unsure what, like in Saudi Arabia, in which there was a perception that the country would be more old, open culturally um, and economically. Um, but then that after the um, uh, Khashoggi uh, murder a couple of years ago, that um, image was kind of shattered. I'd be interested to see what this transition to a new uh, Turkmenistan government is likely to have in the forecoming weeks. We'll see that um, 
hopefully we'll get an indication of a bit of that after um, the election and before the end of uh, this semester. So I shared uh, several videos about the Turkmenistan case. The first one is the longest one, and then the last couple kind of shows um, the current president's uh, vacation uh, habits, which are interesting. John Oliver has a really entertaining video from a couple of years ago about uh, the Turkmenistan leader. Uh, I don't know if it's available, but this I think is an example of an autocratic state with repression to the point in which either greed nor grievance is provided an opportunity to air itself that could potentially lead uh, to conflict. So take a look at those, be interested to see what you think, and we'll come back for the last uh, video of today, kind of making some initial conclusions about the links between political institutions and conflict.